today's gospel passage is that familiar one of the calling of the first disciples, Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, then James and John, sons of Zebedee. The account, because it is so familiar to us, perhaps has lost some of its ability to surprise us. But maybe if we would just look again, we can recover that aspect of it. In Galilee in the first century, just as up until this very day, fishing on the Sea of Galilee is done at night when the fish are less able to detect the nets that have been set to catch them. So we can rightly assume that this particular incident in the ministry of Jesus at the very beginning of it is taking place in the morning when after a night out at the sea, the fishermen are cleaning their boats and mending their nets before retiring at home for the day, knowing that they'd be back again at night to fish. Indeed, the boats would have been parked along the shore or more just a short distance from it. So it is reasonable that while in the boat, the fishermen would have been in clear view and earshot of Jesus as he walked along Capernaum's shore. What is so surprising about the account is the immediacy of the response to Jesus' invitation on the part of those four fishermen. Here they are in a familiar place, carrying out the usual tasks that are necessary to their livelihood. And a seeming stranger comes along and invites them to leave it all behind and do something completely different. And with no report of questions or hesitation, they go off with him. Now, if we check the rest of the story in the Gospel of John, we might find that they weren't completely unfamiliar with Jesus, even though he was new on the scene. Because we are told in that Gospel that Andrew had gone to visit John the Baptist and hear him preach. And while there, Jesus appeared and John pointed him out as the Lamb of God. So Andrew must have told the others about him. So even though those disciples weren't perhaps entirely unprepared to meet Jesus, it's still amazing that when he does appear, they immediately dropped whatever they were doing and turned and followed him. This gospel passage is often used in connection with traditional understandings of Christian vocation and cited as an example of how a complete turn must be made and everything else left behind if someone chooses to go serve God and the church, perhaps as a priest or a religious. And while that might be a valid application of the passage, we should still have to wonder then what this passage is meant to say to the majority of the church, all the baptized, who will not be abandoning their usual place or leaving their customary livelihood to enter seminaries, monasteries, or convents. There has to be another message in this passage that does apply to everyone, regardless of their state of life. And we say that because there's a basic truth. Jesus is always calling each and every one of us, without any exception, to follow him. He, indeed, he's asking us at times to drop what we're doing, to change direction in order to follow him. So perhaps on those days when we're prone to see the glass as half empty and to let the world's problems or our own challenges overwhelm us with negativity, 
Maybe that's Jesus there calling us to turn and follow him by looking for the positive and recognizing our blessings more than our problems. At times when we're on the verge of judging others or about to speak ill of them, perhaps we hear Jesus ask us to drop what we are doing and follow him by blessing and praying for those who admittedly can aggravate us, hurt us, or even offend us. On those days when we're ready to speak or act in anger or let resentment poison our hearts and rob us of our peace, is Jesus not there to invite us to repent, to turn around, to leave that place of bitterness, to follow him in mercy and patience? At those times when we are ready to give up on others, to cast them out of our lives, to sever our ties with them, can we sense Jesus calling us to go the way of forgiveness and reconciliation instead? Indeed, whenever we are tempted to go another way, other than the right way, his gospel way, be it in matters small or great. Can we identify those little qualms of conscience, those little twinges of guilt, as actually Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, tapping us on the shoulder, calling us by name, just as he called those very first disciples, asking us to follow him instead? Let us pray that like Peter, Andrew, James, and John, we will always respond to Jesus with barely a moment's hesitation, always offering a wholehearted yes in turning to follow where he wants to lead us rather than where we under our own lights might tend to want to go.